friends here today who, I hope you don't mind me sharing because I, I thought we said you shared as a recipient of a heart transplant and that's really what it's all about. Um, we have a lot of things in the pipeline. The future hopefully looks bright. Uh, we have so many ongoing trials for different types of cardiomyopathy, disease specific drugs, stem cell therapy, gene markers for rejection so we don't have to do biopsies so often, um, and then wireless devices so you don't have a cord attached to things with you everywhere you go. It limits the, the rate of infection. What can we do? Educate, update medical professionals and, every, and patients about what is really up to date with heart failure today. Are you on the best therapy? Even if you're feeling well, could you be on, on better therapy? Know um, that there are other interventions beyond medications. Know when to refer to a, a heart advanced center, advanced heart failure center. It's never too early, it can only be too late. Um, and know that there are still great options, even when patients seem to be beyond any medical therapy, there are life-saving procedures. Um, it's, it's always better to refer a patient a year too early than a minute too late. Um, it's really a team effort. And I just want to show you, I'm always very proud and privileged to be part of this selection committee meeting every Friday at 7 a.m. There's over 50 people there. It's such a team effort to make decisions on who is a candidate for heart transplant, mechanical support, and uh, it, it's, it, it, takes, it, takes a whole, uh, it takes a village, literally. Um, but thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk here today. Do you have a certain guideline that you follow for who is really appropriate for that? I mean, it's, it, it is a slightly more costly. Yeah, no, great, great question. Can you just repeat the question so everybody yeah, sure. can hear it? So the question is, is there a guideline as to who is a good candidate for cardiomens? You know, typically speaking, um, well, we don't have an official protocol or guideline. We're actually learning as we go along who really would probably benefit and who, who, who wouldn't. Um, but what we, I can just tell you clinically, what we generally use nowadays, first of all, patients with borderline renal function, where you really, you really don't know where, when to push the diuretics, when, not, when you can back up the diuretics. You know, so many uh, uh, physicians out there, is to increase your diuretics. The, crea the creatinine goes up, okay, stop the diuretics. What's more important, your creatinine or breathing? You know, um, what, what do you do? That's one, one, uh, one area. Another area that I'm really starting to push more is HEFPEF, preserved ejection fraction patients, because they're very difficult to treat sometimes. And, and patients with recurrent admissions, I mean certainly patients with recurrent admissions. If someone's very stable and they really don't have a lot of fluid overload problems, we don't, don't necessarily push it. And, uh, and you know, and, and the, other, the other part of the equation is sometimes our patients are left to a very bad right ventricular failure. Their PA pressures are very low. Their wedge is not necessarily that high. You may not get that much out of it, you know. You, you generally will put a swan gas catheter. We'll see, oh, look, their pressures go up to 60, and their PA diastolic pressure correlates with their wedge pressure pretty well. I could probably use this as a good guide. But the, pre and the pressures are pretty normal probably not going to get that much from it unless you can prove that it really goes up when they're not doing well. Thank you. Sure. Uh, very interesting talk. You, you sort of showed the impedance stuff there as an example of misuse or the technology has been used in the past in offices, or cardiology offices. Can you comment, is that I mean, can, can you use it? Is that a dynamic, is it actually a dynamic situation or it will help you if I walk into your office today and I have give you symptoms and you see my impedance, gives you a red light or green light as far as my management, as opposed to you know, this intrathoracic one? Well, I can tell you, you know, in my you know, limited experience though with, um, in, the, in heart failure and, and, and seeing how a lot of other cardiology practices it's not a very common thing that people measure routinely and base their clinical decisions on. First of all, most cardiology offices, or at least you know, many, are not uh, don't uh, interrogate their ICDs or look at that. You know, they'll send them to an EP office, and so you have one guy doing heart failure, the other guy is doing EP. They're not necessarily thinking about the same things. I happen to have one EP doctor that I work with who is always sending me the impedance and saying. 
What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And usually what I do is I say, let me see him. Let me see him. Because I, I'm not just going, I'm not going to react. We don't have the data yet to know that we can just react um, based on those rise in impedance to do it. So I think, you know, I, in, in my experience, I don't think a lot of people are really using it yet clinically. And I think it's going to take more of a, a trial where it's, where it's done properly. Perhaps like the CardioMEMS device, where you have more of a protocol to follow. When you see the impedance start rising, what are you, what are you going to start to change? What are you going to do? Don't just send them to the hospital. You know, um, so that's the point because all your talk is a multi-million dollar talk. Yes. So as a healthcare person, I'm listening to you and say this is great for me, but, you know, but this is really not, you know, population health. That's not what we're all about. So the question is, if there is a simple technology, obsolete technology that can be in smart in smart hands like yours can be applied, then it will make a huge difference. Even if you have a palliative care that you rightfully said is the right way to go. A nurse practitioner can deploy it, call you and say, well, this is what's condition. What should I add to the regimen? I think you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, an ICD is pretty standard of therapy. And that, that, you know, that should span the spectrum even of uh, you know, population health where, where we don't have the funds. And if you have an ICD, you know, we should be able to get impedance readings. Well, we have the funds. We just use them differently. <laughs> well, well, well said. Well said. Uh, Chloe Bird, Dr. Chloe Bird. Um, I was just at a, a cardiovascular meeting in Pittsburgh, and they were talking about uh, seeing higher rates of hep hep uh, among younger adults and women. Um, do you see that over the whole life course, um, or is that particular to younger women? We were focused on gestational issues and the like. Um, no, I, I think we are. I think we are starting to see it more. I mean, it, it certainly has always been a real issue, particularly with elderly women. Mm -hmm. you, you see it very commonly in, in and not just very elderly women, but, but as, as women age, we, we see this very frequently.